Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you to the organisers for the invitation. Um, I wanted to say at the start, I've not come from a holiday in the Alps. I've come from two weeks of exam committees. <laughs> I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to present some work. I presented this work at a workshop in Bielefeld last year, so I apologise if some of you have seen this um, already. I'm going to present some joint work with um, Adam Johansson, Susie Brown, Jerry Koskela, and Dario Spanner, and all of whom are at Warwick with me. Um, and I'm going to talk about weak convergence of non neutral genealogies to King of Scarlet. And that's not a typo. So here is, the motiv here is a motivating question. Um, for the work, phrased in a kind of um, mathematical biology language. So, what is the genealogical scaling limit of a discrete time Canning's population model undergoing mutation and evolving in a time inhomogeneous environment? So, those of you who study population genetics will know there are lots of very famous scaling limits of population models to genealogical limits, typically coalescent type models. Um, and similarly, scaling limits of the same class of discrete models to things like the right fisher diffusion. And we've seen some examples of talks that um, cover those diffusion models. The reason that this question doesn't quite fall into, those, into that class is because of the time in homogeneous environment. So I'll describe exactly what I mean by that. In fact, um, so here's a formal definition of what we might mean by a Canning's model that falls into this class. So just a reminder about Canning's model. So we're going to think about a fixed population size of capital N individuals reproducing in discrete generations. And for the most part, I'll index my generations by K. Um, we're going to give each individual a type. X, K, superscript I will be the type of individual I in generation K. And ideally, for reasons that will become apparent, I would like the type space, the genetic type space, or the allele space of these individuals to be as general as possible. Certainly, I'd like it to be uncountable, for example. And to undergo one generation of reproduction, each individual will have a random number, usually denoted nu, of offspring. And to keep the population size constant, uh, we will all, it will always be the case that the sum of the number of offspring of each individual is equal to capital N, the population size. So these news cannot be independent, but they might, but typically we'd expect them to be well behaved, for example, exchangeable. Okay, so far. Now, to introduce an environment or a fitness landscape, we're going to endow each individual with a fitness parameter W. So, and we can think of W as being the expected number of offspring of that individual, uh, at least up to some normalizing constant. Um, okay, and I'll, I will introduce the usual kinds of mutation processes. I won't go into detail about mutation, and again, we'd like to keep mutation as general as possible, so offspring can differ from their parent, parental type according to some mutation process. The thing that's going to make this really complicated is that the fitness of a given type can vary with generation. So it's very deliberate that, so although it's not very clearly reflected in the notation, I want the fitness of an individual to depend not only on its type, but on the generation K. So the environment can change in gener generation by generation. And I would like that change to be as flexible or as drastic as possible. So an allele that's extremely fit in one generation could suddenly become extremely unfit in the next generation, and vice versa. So ideally, I would like to make as few assumptions as possible on the nature of the environment. So why would I care about this kind of model? Biologically, that seems to be quite an extreme circumstance. Um, but actually, some of the motivation for this comes outside of biology. Um, what's called feynman cax path measures. So these are a class of path measures which are used in many other scientific disciplines. Um, and I'll talk a bit about those now. So, so just to kind of give the game away a bit, what it turns out lots of other fields are studying is precisely a Canning's model in a time in homogeneous environment. So 
um, we can phrase things in terms of a reproductive population model, um, and that's the only real difference to the kinds of population models that we usually study. So what do I mean by a feynman cax path measure? It's going to be some probability distribution on a path, or equivalently a sequence of measures that I'm interested in that are related to each other. And if it's in, the, if it's in this class, we can decompose it in the following way. So I'm going to have some well-behaved Markov chain, Markov process, uh, on the state space, which I'll denote by P. So you can think of P as the kind of prior dynamics, or what your model would do if it was uninterrupted, or in the kind of biological case, it represents the, the neutral evolution of an individual. And this Markov chain is being distorted, or interrupted, or influenced somehow by another function, which I've written in the form of a product of e to the vu, so this is called a potential function. And again, going back to the gen genetics analogue, this is, this is the fitness landscape. So the, the, uh, the kind of, um, the probability that an individual visits a certain region of the state space is influenced by this fitness landscape. And in this particular decomposition, actually I can decompose it into product form, but I don't always have to do that. And because of the influence of this potential function, I want to renormalize this into a probability measure, so I have this normalizing constant. In many real applications, z will be intractable, and therefore the entire path measure will be intractable, in the sense that I can't solve this analytically. Um, and so what statisticians often do is they will employ a particle-based approximation of this path measure. So to our ears, we would hear that what they are doing is they are evolving a population model within this state space, and the empirical distribution of that population is an empirical approximation to this measure k. Okay, so some examples of where this comes up. This comes up in lots of different places. So the analogy with genetics is that we have a p is a genotype evolving in a population, and v is some expression of a fitness landscape. Um, these kinds of models come up a lot in physics. Um, for example, you might have the, a model for the evolution of particles in some medium, and maybe in certain regions of the medium there is absorption of the particles at a certain rate given by the current position xu. Uh, and so the potential function would be representing some rate of absorption. <coughs> in statistical models, um, this is often, this is really the kind of, um, posterior distribution of the latent part of a hidden Markov model given some noisy observations from it. So in that case, P, the Markov chain, is describing the latent part of the hidden Markov model, and the potential function V is none other than the log likelihood. Um, just to emphasize, just to give you an example of an application of a kind of statistical model which is outside of biology, but which really we can phrase as a Canning's model. Um, so here's a famous example um, about robot localization. So the idea is here is that we have a robot which is moving around some office space, and we would like to um, infer the location of the robot based on some sensory information that it's taking in. So maybe the robot has a, an infrared camera or something. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to evolve a particle-based approximation to the posterior distribution of the location of the robot given the sensory information that we've received. And initially we may have no knowledge of where the robot is, so we will sample, this is what these dots represent, an empirical, um, we'll take an empirical sample from a uniform distribution over the location in the office. Then we run the robot for a few steps. The robot takes in some information, so we have some now idea of where it might be. So maybe the sensory information is telling us the robot's inside a doorway, but we're not sure which doorway it is, and it's near the end of the corridor. So if we can evolve our population in the right way, the particles that survive, the fit particles, will be the ones which are good at explaining the data that has been received. They are the ones that have high fitness. So I'm going to keep switching between kind of statistics language and biology language and, and try to emphasize that they're really talking about the same thing. So here fitness is really high likelihood. Um, 
Yeah, so thinness is high. Okay, and we go a bit further, we get some more data, and now the, the posterior distribution is, is quite um, clustered around the, two, the true position of the robot. Uh, things like tracking objects, it really um, are important origins of these kinds of algorithms. So the very first, these are called particle filters. The very first particle filters came from military applications, from defense researchers who were interested in approximating the location of like a missile or a, or a plane from radar measurements. Okay, so some further notation, just to, just to emphasize the point, um, and hopefully this will be useful for the next talk. Um, so here is a hidden Markov model, by which we mean we have an unobserved Markov chain X, um, and I'm going to denote the tra transitions by F, and then conditioned on the, the chain, observations are conditionally independent of each other and depend only on their respective uh, time points, and for simplicity I'll assume they all have the same observation density G. Uh, there are more sophisticated versions of this. Um, but where we could, for example, let f and g vary with time, but I'll try and keep things simple here. Yeah. So when I write x 1 colon t, y 1 colon t, this is the vector of the latent states and the vector of the observations. Um, yeah. Okay. So often what we're interested in is called either the filtering problem or the smoothing problem, which are respectively we want to know the probability distribution of the current location, the true location of the robot, given all of the observations up to the current time. Or we may even be interested in the harder problem of inferring the entire trajectory of the unobserved process, given the observations up to the current time. And we can try to do something like express this smoothing distribution recursively, so the smoothing distribution up to time t can be expressed in terms of the smoothing distribution up to time t minus 1. And so there are recursive formulas that we can try to work with, but except in very special cases, like all of these distributions are Gaussian, this kind of recursion cannot be solved um, explicitly. So this is the motivation for considering a particle approximation um, to these kinds of models. So here is a very simple implementation of what's called the bootstrap particle filter. Um, so this is, this is an algorithmic description of what I've just been hinting at. So we're going to carry a weighted particle system, and suppose we've evolved it up to time t minus 1. To evolve the particle system up to time t, I'm just going to sample a, an update of the next true position from the underlying dynamics, what was called f on the previous slide, or the p, the Markov chain bit. And now I need to account for the fact that there is this fitness landscape governing which observations are more important than others. So I'm going to attach what's called an importance weight, to, um, which is proportional to the observation density. So as a statistician would call this an importance weight, we might call it fitness. Um, so the steps one and two, if you were to iterate those, that would be called a generic application of sequential importance sampling. And the insight of the original bootstrap filter is that actually, if you just run an important sampling algorithm, it won't work very well because the dynamics of the underlying process, F, nowhere are they really influenced by the observations. So if I was to run just steps one and two for a very long time, the Markov chain could wander off wherever it likes and it's kind of ignoring the fitness landscape. And we really want to focus our particles like in our robot example, we want particles to focus their attention on the important regions of the fitness landscape. So the way we achieve that with a bootstrap filter is to resample the particles. Well, that's very nice to a population geneticist. Now it's looking even more like a population model. So the original bootstrap filter would say we will resample multinomially all of the particles according to their fitnesses. Okay, so this is really, this is a Cummings model, so it's a non-neutral Cummings model. And so step three is really, it's a slightly convoluted way of writing, I will multinomially resample each particle according to its fitness. And then I extend another step. 
And why does this work? Well, you know, there's all sorts of theory underlying particle filtering to explain why this works. For example, there is a law of large numbers which tells us that the weighted empirical measure of these paths will converge in a, in a suitable sense to the true measure that we're interested in approximating, what I've called K. And we have central limit theorems, and we have Duvenko Cantelli type results, and all sorts of other things. And the kind of classic reference for this to a statistician would be the book by Dale Morell from 2004. All right, so here's the same thing in pictorial form. I have a sequence of observations, which is shown in green, and I'm going to evolve my particle system forwards in time. So I evolve them forwards in time according to the prior dynamics, not, not looking at the observations. I weight, my I weight the locations of each particle according to how well, how well they explain the data at the current time, and then I resample them. And so maybe the blue ones are the ones that re got resampled, they are stochastically duplicated, I will keep at least one copy of them. And the red ones may be the ones that got lost, so they are stochastically discarded, and in this case the red ones are the ones that have zero offspring. And then I extend again, I go forward another step, I weight my particles, I resample them, I keep the blue ones in this case, and I keep going. And because of the resampling mechanism, I can ensure that the particle system will stay on track. It will stay in the regions of high fitness. It will stay in the regions which explain the observations well. Okay, um, so one more thing I should probably say um, before going back to some biology is that there are many other versions of the bootstrap filter. The bootstrap filter is the most simple version of a particle filter. Um, and you can go back and try and do something cleverer at every step. Um, so for example, you don't have to resample multinomially. There are other resampling mechanisms which are superior in, in certain measures. Um, so what that would mean to us would mean we don't have to use a right Fisher model where the resampling is multinomial. We could use some other model, some other model within the Canning's class where the offspring distributions are different than the multinomial distribution. The other change that I want to highlight is that we don't have to sample from the underlying prior dynamics, F. Really, we can sample from whatever Markov chain we like, and F is clearly not the best choice. What we should be sampling from is some Markov chain which tries to follow the observations. And that is, um, can be achieved by a change of measure. So instead, I'm going to sample my process from some proposal measure Q, and usually I'll hope that I can decompose it into a sequential proposal measure, so I can do it step by step as usual. The only change that I have to make is that I have to alter the fitnesses to account for the fact that I'm running the wrong marker chain. Um, and so now the fitnesses are not just given by the observation density G, but by the ratio of the transition probabilities, uh, the prior dynamics divided by the proposal dynamics. So this is just another example of importance sampling. And all we're really doing, if you go back to the final tax decomposition, is we're kind of playing around with the P and the potential function V. And we're allowed to kind of move some of the mass from the potential function into the P and, and change what we're calling P and change what we're calling V. Um, and so this is the rearrangement that corresponds to this change. The, the, path, the, the Markov chain driving this process is now Q, and the potential function is the original potential function multiplied by this likelihood ratio, which is accounting for the change of measure. Okay, and there's the algorithm again. So what I've done is I've changed F to Q, and I've changed the, the importance weight to account for this additional factor. So, so the bootstrap filter will typically work much better than standard important sampling because this resampling mechanism is keeping our particles on track. However, it introduces its own problems and you can summarise those problems in a single phrase which is path degeneracy. Once we run this model for a long time, we this audience will be very aware that this process, a realisation of this process, will induce a genealogy, a ge genealogical relationships between the particles. 
Um, but from a statistical point of view, that's not necessarily good news because if you look back to earlier parts of the process, we may still be interested in estimating the distribution of the hidden state, given the observation, at an earlier time. That's a marginal of the, of the smoothing distribution that we're interested in. But because of common ancestry, the effective number of particles which are estimating this distribution is very, very small. And if we are earlier than the most recent common ancestor of this genealogy, actually we're only using one particle to estimate a, distribute, a marginal distribution. So this is what known as partigenesis, and it's something we want to avoid if, the, if we're applying this to a statistical problem. Um, there are, a lot, there are several other reasons why we may be interested in understanding the genealogy of the particle filter. So here are a couple of others. One is the memory requirements of the filter. If I want to run this thing on a computer, the size of the genealogy is really measuring how much storage space I need. So, so the total branch length of the tree, you can translate into memory requirements on a computer. There is also some re recent work, especially by Lee and Whiteley, which actually express statistical properties like estimator variance directly in terms of genealogical properties. So estimator variance in particular can be expressed in terms of the probability that the common ancestor of two randomly chosen branches is equal to the population of the most recent common ancestor. And we population geneticists like to compute quantities like this. So, I think I've belaboured the point enough now, but there, um, I think um, statisticians have kind of, they have recognised the analogy between um, population models and statistical models, and when you read about particle filters, they use phrases like selection steps and mutation steps and resampling steps, so the analogy is kind of recognised, but I don't think the body of population genetics theory that we have available to us has been fully exploited in understanding particle filters. And so one of the things I want to do is um, to gain an a priori characterization of the distribution of the genealogy of an inter interacting particle system within this framework. Okay. Right. So let's switch gears a bit. So we're looking for a scaling limit for the genealogy for this kind of model. And I'm giving away the answer here because here's a picture of Kingman's coalescence. Um, here's, a one, here's a one slide picture of what we mean by Kingman's coalescence. To describe Kingman's coalescence is quite straightforward. The only difficulty really is getting the right notation to write it down in an efficient way. And the solution that Kingman came up with was to notice that there is a bijection between a random tree and a random partition value stochastic process. So the coalescent is a random uh, tree valued object, and to, just to write down a realization of it, I'm going to associate it with a path of partitions of the integers. Um, and here's a picture where I have seven leaves, n equals seven leaves, and so the partition will be on the integers one up to seven. The initial condition is that each individual is in its own block, so the finest possible partition. And to associate the two processes with each other, we will associate coalescence events, common ancestry events, with merging blocks of the partition with each other. Um, and so in words, we will be merging each pair of blocks independently at rate 1, and if we run this for long enough, we will find the most recent common ancestor of the entire sample, which is the, the trivial partition of a sing comprising a single block. <coughs> All right. uh, and here it is with a bit more notation, so I'm going to denote R superscript little n, the stochastic process taking values on the state space of partitions of, little n, of 1 up to little n, the initial condition is the fine partition, and here is the, the generator which tells me what all the transitions are. So at rate 1, there will be transitions from the partition psi to the partition eta, if eta can be obtained from psi by merging two blocks, and no other kinds of transitions are possible. So we will identify this with the tree structure by saying that two elements i and j are in the same block in the partition, if and only at time t, if and only if individuals i and j have found a common ancestor at time t of God. <coughs>
OK so far. All right. So what kinds of convergence theorems do we have access to where we start with a Cannings model and we end with a coalescent process? Um, well, there's, there's a sequence of papers um, tackling this kind of problem going all the way back to the original papers by Kingman. So Kingman has a, a convergence result under slightly stronger conditions than, ne than are necessary. And they have been subsequently relaxed in the last 40 years or so um, to get some quite general conditions. So I'm going to just summarize what is roughly the most general possible convergence theorem we can expect within the Kingman domain. So I'm not talking about uh, lambda coalescence in this talk. The key quantity that governs convergence to the coalescence is this thing here, which we can think of as a coalescence probability. This is the probability that if I pick two individuals in some generation, and I ask what's the probability that they share a parent one generation ago, it is this, it is this probability here. So this is a kind of sampling without replacement. The probability that both of my individuals picked individual I as their parent, and then I sum over all of the possible parents. One thing I should emphasize is that this probability is conditioned on the values of mu, it's conditioned on the offspring counts. Usually, we would take ne next we would take an expectation over the values of the mu's, um, but actually I need to do that later on, so I'm going to change my notation a bit. So this is the Probability, this is the coalescent probability conditioned on the offspring counts. And a lot of the work on generalizing convergence theorems was done by Merle and Sagatov. Um, and here is one of their results, which says, I'm going to take the corresponding partition process of the Cannings model, of the neutral Cannings model. And so the only change in notation is my, ind my subscript is now discrete because I'm tracking discrete generations. And my superscript uh, is noting that the partition process will depend on capital N, the population size, and little n, the sample size, that is the number of leaves of the genealogy that I'm interested in. So what does the result say? It says that the partition value process of the Cannings model will converge in a state space of Cadillac paths to Kingman's coalescent under some conditions, which we'll look at in a minute, but the, the other thing we want to notice is that this convergence will take place under a time rescaling. And the, the relevant time rescaling is indeed this coalescence probability, averaging over the values of the offspring counts nu. So what does that mean? Well, we know that on the, co on the standard coalescent time scale, n two individuals are coalescing at rate 1. And so we need to rescale time so that the accumulated opportunity for coalescence in the Cannings model <coughs> corresponds to that time scale. And that's why we need to change the time scale by a factor of the coalescence probability. So when will this convergence happen? Well, we have two conditions. One is that this coalescence probability is going to zero in any individual generation. That's a very natural condition because we really need this condition so that the limiting process is really a continuous time process. And the amazing thing that Merler and Sagatov have shown is that we only need one more condition. And this is the extra condition, which we can unpack because we recognize this thing on the left hand side as being the probability that three individuals share a parent one generation ago. And what they're saying is the probability that three individuals share a parent one generation ago is little o of the coalescence probability. Or in other words, the probability that we share three parents one generation ago is going to zero strictly quicker than the probability that two individuals share a parent one generation ago. In fact, this first condition is implied by the second, so I could have written this down in a slightly more efficient way. Um, but really, what's, what's nice about this theorem is what is not in the conditioning. There is no conditioning about the probability that four individuals share a parent. There is no condition requ requirement about the probability that two different sets of pairs share a parent. There's no probability about a 5 merger or a 6 merger or a 3 and a 2 merger or anything else. 
A lot of the work of what Merlot and Sagatov did boiled down to controlling moments of the multinomial distribution, for example. So what we want to know is that if I have control of the third moment of a multinomial distribution, I also have control over the fourth moment and the fifth moments and the cross moments, and that is what they showed. So this is a very nice theorem because it only really gives us one thing to check, which is the probability of a triple merger in a single generation. Um, this work is all assuming neutrality, so we need to modify this for a non-neutral process. Um, hopefully that kind of motivates or explains why I've not taken an expectation in my coalescence probability. In Merlin and Sagatov's work, every generation is the same as every other generation in distribution. And so I can take an expectation because these news have the same distribution in every generation. In, in, in our application, the fitness landscape can change dramatically every generation, and therefore the distribution of mu can change dramatically in every generation, and I need to be able to account for that. So I'm not allowed to take an expectation yet. All right, so I think I've said this. Um, we want to do the same thing for a non-neutral Cannings model. I'm going to use essentially the same notation, except I'm going to write G instead of R. So G is going to be the genealogy of little n particles sampled from a non-neutral Cannings model of size capital N. And I emphasize, like Merle and Sagatov and Kingman, the convergence results we are getting are for a fixed number of leaves, the genealogy of a fixed number of leaves, in a larger population, and it's only the larger population size which is going to infinity. Okay. So, why is this difficult? Um, well, one thing to notice is that we just want the partition process. The partition process is not telling us about the locations, the x's along the branches, and it's not telling us about the fitnesses, the w's. So it's just the marginal genealogy. That makes, uh, so that's why we're calling it an a priori description. We are effectively marginalizing over realizations of the model, but we're not marginalizing over the environment. The environment is given to us at the beginning and we're regarding this as fixed, and it could be very badly behaved. One reason for the, well, the main reason for the difficulty is that our genealogy is not going to be a Markov process. Um, one reason we can see that is that if I gave you a kind of partially constructed genealogy, you may notice that one branch has a large number of offspring in a small time period. And so you may think, okay, well this, it's likely then that this branch represents an individual which is, which is very fit. And that tells me maybe if the environment is constant, it's going to have lots of offspring later on. So knowledge about the distant past of the genealogy can be informative about the present, and that's effectively why this thing is not a marginal process. We're marginalizing over fitnesses, but fitnesses are really persisting over multiple generations. Okay, so that's, that's the key source of technical difficulty in, in getting results like this. Other, except for that, we would like to kind of pursue the strategy that Merla used, um, so again, we'll define this coalescence probability C, and we need an analogue of the time change. So in Merler's result, the time change is this thing here, 1 over the coalescence probability, or 1 over the expected coalescence probability. Because the mu's are changing every generation, potentially, we need a slightly different time change. Our time change is going to be random. This is a random time change. Um, but it is really doing the same job. It's the generalized inverse of this function, which is, again, we can think of as the accumulated coalescence probabilities accumulated over generations. So this is the sum of the pairwise merger probability summed over different generations. So this is the random time change that's going to put the time in homogeneous evolution of the model onto the coalescent time scale. All right, so here is the result. Um, so let's go through it and see how it differs from Merlin and Sagatov's result. So this time we have a non-neutral model. 
we have a couple of extra assumptions, but I, I claim that those assumptions are not too strong. The first one is that all assignments of offspring to parents are equally likely given the offspring counts. Actually, that assumption is also in Verbert Zagton's work. I didn't spell it out very clearly. This is not a very strong assumption. This is just saying that the way that I label my offspring should be kind of uniform. So that I can't say that particle number one in my system is special in some sense across generations. The second condition is also new, which is to say that my random time change does not explode with probability one. Or sorry, with probability one, my random time change does not explode. Again, that's a reasonable assumption. So how can I convert that into something more intuitive? That's saying something like the fitness landscape is not becoming so badly behaved that I cannot hope to get a king and coalescent uh, limit. The next two conditions are effectively the same as before. We need the expected coalescence probability to go to zero, and this is the same thing as before, written slightly differently. We need the triple merger probability to go to zero quicker than the binary merger probability. The only difference is that we are conditioning on a filtration, and that filtration, unfortunately, <coughs> is a reverse time filtration. So it's so we made lots of mistakes trying to write this down until we, we kind of got the, the direction of time correct. We're constructing a genealogy going backwards in time. So we have a filtration which is starting in the present day and it's actually going backwards. And we need to condition on the outcomes of all of the offspring distributions up to the, up to the time we've got to um, for this to make sense. So modulo this slight change where these become conditional expectations, the conclusion is exactly the same. We take the non-neutral Canning's model, we apply a random time change, and we get Kingman's coalescence in the limit. Um, and this convergence takes place um, in a pathwise sense. So we're not just talking about finite dimensional distributions. Um, I should say something about the proof. Um, so I've said, so how would we how would we prove convergence usually? If I have a sequence of Markov processes and I want to show convergence to a Markov process limit, um, there's lots of theory about that and often it, you can simplify things because you, you can open Ethier and Kurtz and check that you just need to check for convergence of the generators of the pre-limiting processes under certain conditions. But we don't have a Markov process here so we can't do that. So what we actually had to do was to do this by bare hands and check for convergence of the finite dimensional distributions directly. Um, and that, in, that, that essentially involves summing over all possible paths in the partition process space. So I have to think about if I start at some given partition and I end at some other partition a time t later, what are the paths that my partition process can take to get from one to the other? Uh, so there's lots of combinatorics and there's lots of bounding from above and below transition probabilities um, so that we can show that in the limit the bounds above and below of these transition probabilities converge to each other and they converge to the transition probabilities of the Kingman coalescent. Once we've got finite dimensional distributions, the other ingredient that we need um, to get weak convergence is to show tightness of the processes. In the context of these, of these processes, tightness corresponds to... So what do we mean by tightness? We want to show that we are not losing any probability mass anywhere. We have convergence of the finite dimensional distributions, so the only way that something could still go wrong is that there is some probability mass which is escaping somehow. And in the context of these Cadillac processes, the, the escape of mass would correspond to the accumulation of jumps at a single so we can verify tightness, and this follows an argument of Merle quite closely, by showing that the jumps of the process are sufficiently well separated. So with sufficiently high probability, um, a given gap delta between jumps occurs um, for, all ju for all pairs of jumps. Um, all right, 
So we have this result, and now the good news is I can take my population genetics textbook and I can give it to a statistician and say all of these results now apply to your particle filter mm -hmm. under certain conditions. So for example, they may ask what is the distribution of the height of the genealogy, the total height of the tree, or the total branch length. And these are classical results in coalescent theory. And we know, for example, that the expected height of the tree is going to be proportional to the population size capital A when we go back to the original generational time scale. Um, and the variance of the height of the tree is going to be proportional to n squared. <coughs> Um, and we can do all the usual exercises. We can we can write down uh, the total the distribution of the total branch length, any other function of the tree. And because we have weak convergence, we can ask for things which don't just depend on finite dimensional distributions. So the height of the tree is not something you can get from just the finite dimensional distributions. Okay. Um, one I will just illustrate that. Although the theory has certain assumptions associated with it, it does seem to work quite well when those assumptions do not hold. Here's an example of a, of a filtering problem where the assumptions do not hold. This is a discrete time Ornstein overvec process. Um, we have a Gaussian initial condition and we have Gaussian noise applied to the observations of that process. Um, now, this is a fairly straightforward problem, but it's not easy to convert this into the assumptions of the theorem. So how do I convert this model into a statement about the probability of a triple merger, for example? That's not so straightforward. So we did some simulations just to verify that. The Kingman scalings do seem to hold, even if we try to break the theory by taking the, by asking for the genealogy of the entire population, not just for some fixed sample size. And we can also change the resampling mechanism. So I've been focusing on multinomial resampling, but there are other resampling mechanisms which are quite widely used in the statistical literature, um, which correspond to quite strange canons models, but which from a statistical point of view make a lot of sense. Um, so <coughs> I don't think, well, here's a selection of results. So what's going on here? So the x-axis is the sample size. Um, the y-axis is the expected height of the tree, and I guess these results are just showing that we do get very rapid convergence. And we can check, I didn't plot the analytical answer, but these converge very, very nicely by comparison with the theory. Um, and the different trajectories are showing different kinds of resampling mechanisms. So these are probably the four most popular in in the particle filtering community, so we have multinomial resampling, what's called residual resampling, stratified resampling, and systematic resampling. Um, another comment that's quite important to make is that we would like to try to convert these conditions into something that we can have some intuition about. So when does this third moment condition apply? We need to, if we, if we have a given model, we need to convert it really into a statement about this probability. And we can find some quite simple, sufficient conditions for this to hold. Um, so the genealogy of n particles, we're looking at a non-neutral Canning's model of size n, multinomial sampling. So we have a, a, a result which says that this converges to the coalescence under the rescaling of time, if we have strong mixing, by which I mean the observation density is bounded above and below by some constants, and um, the proposal distribution is bounded above and below by some multiple of some distribution. So let's convert that into biological language. The first condition is saying that well, these are observation densities, so these are corresponding to the fitness landscape. The fitness landscape is bounded above and below. That's a very reasonable assumption. There are no, there are no alleles which are arbitrarily better than other alleles. There are no alleles which are arbitrarily worse than other alleles. The proposal mechanism, this is moving particles around in the state space. So the location of a particle is corresponding to a genetic type. So random movement of location is corresponding to mutation. And we need this distribution to be the bound in the distribution, sorry, the distribution in the bound to be independent of the current location. 
So biologically, we're saying we need mutation to have a parent-independent component. And if you've worked with mutation operators, you'll be very familiar with the fact that having a parent-independent component in the model is very, very helpful in lots of situations. It effectively makes your model reversible, for example. Okay, so under those sufficient conditions, there may be weaker conditions which we haven't found, but these are indeed sufficient conditions um, for the, this third model to apply. Uh, so how do we prove that? Well, effectively, the bound on the fitness landscape gives us bounds on the weights, on the fitnesses, um, and then we can apply standard moment calculations for multinomial distributions. Okay. Oh, I didn't think I had time to go through the proof of the main theorem, but maybe I did have time. I, I won't bother going back and, and dredging it up again, so I'll, I'll finish. Um, I'll finish there. So what have we shown? The domain of attraction of the Kingman coalescent includes some non-Markovian models under a random time change. Oh, that was one thing I should have said. Um, the random time change is natural, but it's probably not the best way that we could express our result. So let's go back to the same result. Convergence is under a random time change. We would like this to have practical implications, and it does have some practical implications. We can make predictions about the shape of the tree. We can say things about which resampling mechanisms are better than other resampling mechanisms. Um, and we can say a few other things. Um, but what we can't say very precisely at the moment is what does the time change look like for a given problem? Even if I just have this einstein unabek problem with noisy observation, it's not completely obvious what the time change actually will be for a typical realisation of that filter. So I guess an open problem, one that I think we would really like to tackle, is how can I can change this random time change into a non-random time change? Mohler's time change is non-random. It's the expected coalescence probability in any given generation. Ours has to be random in the sense that we need to be able to account for the randomness the change in environment in every generation. But I guess the next step would be, um, why don't I give the environment itself some stochastic process, and then I can say things about the distribution of the environment, and if I average over the distribution of the environment, I can average over what the time change is doing. So there should be, I think this will be future work, there should be a step which says, if my environment has a certain distribution, what does it do? what is the average behaviour of the time change. Okay. Um, so this has led to applications in computational statistics. We have developed simple conditions which are about as complicated and no more complicated than Merler's conditions, for which the genealogy of little n particles from an interacting particle system converges to the Kingman coalescent under a random time scale. And it seems like our, our theorem is slightly more restrictive than it has to be. Simulations seem to suggest that it works um, under, <coughs> under modelled where the theory doesn't apply. Okay, so these are, the, these are the references. This took us three papers to work out all of these details. The first one does convergence of finite dimensional distributions under quite complicated assumptions. The second one does convergence of finite dimensional distributions, and we simplified the assumptions to be as simple as Merle and Sagatov. Um, and then the final paper, which is currently under review, uh, extends finite dimensional distributions to weak convergence. Uh, and those are the other things I refer to. Okay, I think that's it from me. Um, thank you very much for listening.